If we understand that the influence on health disparities are partly lifestyle, partly behavior, exercise, and eating, I think the interventions at that level can really help with tough issues like COVID and diabetes and the real serious health disparities that we do have. So we need to have a really balanced approach. Michael Jindra, a cultural anthropologist at Boston University, with us on Heterodox Out Loud. Today's episode, Why Bad Things Happen, COVID and Health Inequality. I'm Zach Rausch. This show is about how we explain why bad things happen. We hear the story of Michael Jindra, a professor who challenges the common narrative around health inequality in the United States. We learn about the resistance he faced in academia and answers he finally found. Our topics include free will, systemic racism, and personal responsibility. Before our interview, let's start with Michael's blog, COVID, Health Inequality, and the Avoidance of Behavioral Explanations. The narrator is Jonathan Todd Ross. COVID, Health Inequality, and the Avoidance of Behavioral Explanation, written by Michael Jindra, was originally published on March 10th, 2021. The original blog post can be found on the Heterodox Academy website. It has been lightly edited for clarity and is read by Jonathan Todd Ross. When it comes to politically fraught social problems, many academics and commentators fail to find the balance needed to adequately understand social problems and come up with effective solutions. To do so well requires good social theory, an understanding of the relationship between human action and the structures and cultures that both fosters and limits such action. The narratives popular in social sciences, however, often produce one-sided theory and approaches. Barbara Ehrenreich's work, for instance, is popular on college campuses because she tells stories of oppressive structures weighing down noble citizens, but unfortunately criticizes ground-level programs that could actually help them. The COVID pandemic has brought to light one major social problem, inequality in health. Besides age, Underlying conditions such as obesity, diabetes, heart issues, and respiratory problems were the key factors distinguishing those who suffered few effects and those who plain suffered and died. Minorities were hit especially hard, some because of their increased exposure due to service jobs, but even then those hit hardest often had pre-existing health conditions. These pre-existing conditions are rooted in larger and worsening health inequalities. Differences in life expectancy by U.S. County have been growing since 1980. By 2014, residents of the highest life expectancy county outlived those in the lowest by 20 years. Counties in central Colorado saw the largest increase in life expectancy, while counties from Oklahoma to West Virginia fared the worst. Why the variation? A long-standing answer is structural factors like the healthcare system, food deserts in inner cities, or the stress of being poor, echoed frequently in places like the pages of the New York Times. Yet multiple studies show that behavioral factors make the difference in health more than socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, or healthcare system factors. The main driver of the dietary gap, I'd argue, is cultural and interactional the shared beliefs and practices of people around us. Peers have a strong influence on our eating habits, exercise, and ultimately on chronic diseases like obesity. Diet researchers have divided people into categories such as physical fantastic, decent doolittle, or non-interested nihilist, based on their eating and fitness habits. These categories are not evenly distributed across America, but tend to cluster together. The southeastern U.S. has a larger proportion of non-interested nihilists, people who eat poorly and do not exercise. Colorado is home to a high number of physical fantastics, 24% of the population, people who pay avid attention to diet and fitness. Behavioral factors are key. Which food and exercise culture you belong to significantly impacts how long you live. In a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, Healthcare only accounts for 10% of premature deaths, genes are 
while behavioral patterns like eating, inactivity, and smoking have the most influence at 40%. Behavioral factors are often class and culturally patterned. We see this process in the dietary gap between the social classes, which has increased over time. Wealthier, higher-status Americans increasingly flock toward farmer's markets, organic shops, and restaurants promising local seasonal cuisine. They follow ever more elaborate exercise and supplement regimens, and they shun smoking. At the same time, lower-income residents continue to consume fast food and prepared foods at high rates. They exercise less and smoke more. People don't share the same conceptions of healthy lifestyle, notions of body size, or taste in food. Some of the highest levels of cardiovascular disease and obesity in the nation are to be found in the so-called stroke belt of the Deep South and Appalachia with high rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Among African Americans, the behavioral patterns of the Southern diet contribute to obesity and diabetes, making African American dietary patterns especially resistant to nutrition interventions. In general, African Americans don't share the same cultural aspirations toward thinness that whites have and tend to accept larger body sizes. This is true across social classes. Surveys show they eat more for enjoyment than whites, who have more guilt about food and also more anorexia, which highlights that either extreme presents problems. The longevity among Asian Americans, the highest in the United States, appears to be partly related to their cultural practices around diet, which involves low fat intake and high fruit and vegetable consumption. Lower income groups, such as poor white Appalachians, tend to be more fatalistic about their health, believing that God or other outside forces are in control. This can contribute to less preventative actions, ranging from less attention to diet and exercise, fewer doctor visits, even adjusting for access to health care, or less intense social distancing to prevent disease transmission. The alleged existence of food deserts in inner cities is another way that scholars have deflected attention away from people's behavioral preferences. The difference between food availability in high-income areas versus low-income areas is 90% due to demand, not supply. The pull of convenient, fatty, and unhealthy food is simply too strong. Laudable attempts to start farmers' markets in inner cities end up serving mostly people who are already eating healthy. None of this denies that systemic racism and other external forces are factors. Discrimination has had an impact on income and wealth inequality. Universal health insurance is a must. But when it comes to health, external forces matter less, and culture and behavior matter more. In other words, behavior at the individual level matters more than structure when it comes to diet and its related health outcomes. This means structural change won't do much to help people. It doesn't mean individuals alone are to blame or that individual willpower will solve the problem. It means that interventions must target culture, group beliefs, social forces, peer networks. Public health researchers have been able to follow the spread of obesity in a social network over 32 years, especially among pairs of friends and siblings of the same sex. Their conclusion, people tended to gain weight when their friends and relatives gained weight around them. In the discussion of COVID, these factors are often avoided by writers in journals and newspapers who decry racial capitalism or structures that make low-income populations or minorities more vulnerable. There are strong pressures in writing on social problems to avoid blaming the victim. It's understandable that academics don't want to unfairly blame people that are struggling. As anthropologist Richard Schwader has noted, however, there is a problem when victimization becomes the dominant account of suffering and when it becomes politically incorrect to ever hold people responsible for their misery. This encourages people to think and act as passive victims with few personal capabilities, which certainly does not contribute to their well-being. Schwader argues that people need to be aware of whatever degree of personal control they have over their own conditions, without going to the extreme of laying all responsibility on individuals. Unfortunately, in sociology and anthropology, structural-only explanations are common.
Witness the books that treat the poor entirely as victims, such as blaming the poor or disciplining the poor. Similar pressures are at play in Australia, where the ill health and poverty of Aborigines have been a contentious national issue for decades. Australian medical anthropologist Emma Koval has argued that anti-racist whites, who understandably lament Australia's past oppression of Aborigines, overstructuralize the problem and ignore cultural and behavioral differences, which prevents effectively addressing this problem through patient work at the local and regional level. Another Australian anthropologist refers to it as guilt politics that has led to no discernible improvement in Aboriginal life over decades of trying. I have worked with marginalized populations, and they commonly acknowledge their own responsibility and behavior for their life paths. They often have a better sense or balance than academics who lament what they see as the self-blaming attitudes of the poor. They can be hard on themselves, often too hard, given the built-in disadvantages that many have. But when people look back on their lives, they can see their own mistakes. Most of us don't like assumptions that we are powerless or simply victims of structures. It's reflexivity and personal interventions that often gives us an understanding and sense of agency toward the future, as in this effective diabetes prevention program. Any sophisticated analysis of social problems needs to consider structures, cultures, and individual factors. There are scholars who are balanced and have good models, like sociologists Martin Sanchez Jankowski or Orlando Patterson, who write on urban poverty. But they don't get the attention they deserve. If academics and commentators really want to effectively address social problems, they need to avoid overly politicizing issues and follow the evidence, which often implicates our own practices and habits as much as it does larger systemic issues. Jonathan Todd Ross reading Michael Jindra's blog, COVID, Health Inequality, and the Avoidance of Behavioral Explanations. Michael joins us now. Can you tell me your story and why you decided to write the blog? Well, I'm a cultural anthropologist, so I've always been fascinated by how people live diverse lives. And I've seen the impact of different people living in different ways. More recently, I've gotten interested in social problems. And so I've been doing research along with my wife on social issues and disparities. So it's a big issue. It's a hot issue. And I've not been particularly pleased with lots of the discourse on health disparities, especially since COVID started. I think they're really missing something. And that's the behavioral aspect, the different kind of lifestyles that people have and how that impacts it. So it's just kind of a natural application of being a cultural anthropologist and trying to understand how people live different lives. Can you give a little bit of historical context to help better situate us within this academic discourse where, as you bring up in the blog, structural explanations are perceived as being generally good, while talking about personal responsibility often is considered bad, specifically when talking about marginalized groups. It's understandable, I guess you could say, the situation as we have it now, which is that you can only really blame systems or structures, and you can't really look at people and what we do. It's an outgrowth of you know the civil rights movement, of understanding and empathy with marginalized populations, but I don't think in the long run it does a service. So I've always advocated, and I mentioned this in the article, we have to look at structures, at cultures, and at individuals, all three of those things. And right now the emphasis is really only on structures, especially, at least in the press, which tends to lean politically left. And so right now, the victimization is such a big issue, and you can't really blame people. As soon as you look at behaviors, people will say, well, you're blaming the victim or you're blaming the people themselves. And that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to look at understanding how people behave. And we have not just individual influences, but we're influenced by our cultures, we're influenced by our structures, and we have to look at that all of these aspects to understand what's happening here. And so what do you think are some of the potential unintended drawbacks when the discourse is only around structural issues? The people, I think you're not really getting at the issue of, in particular in health here, why people eat and exercise the way they do. 
structures don't have much of an influence in that. The food desert controversy is an example of that. There's a belief that, well, people aren't eating healthy because they don't have availability of vegetables or healthy food in their area. They've studied that. They've looked at that. It's not really a cause of people's unhealthy eating. If you've put healthy outlets in areas where they're not there before, people don't change their eating behaviors a lot. That's because we're influenced by taste and by habits and by what we want to eat more so than simply the availability of what's there. So the nutrition interventions that we need are more, I think, group-based. They're more based on getting people to understand that certain foods are healthier, that exercising is better. And if we can change our behaviors, we can have a real impact on health, especially on issues like diabetes that are really hurting people in the COVID epidemic that we're having right now. So when you talk about these three things, the structures, kind of culture, and then the individual, do you see them all interacting with each other? And do you see some being more important than others, or are they kind of on equal footing, or it depends? There's always an interaction between the three. I mean, our individual behavior is affected by culture and structure, and then those things can feed into the cultures and the structures too. If you change individual behavior, you can affect the culture and eventually affect the structures also. If you're looking at health disparities, there's been some good studies that say it's about 40% due to behavioral differences between different populations and maybe 30% due to genetics. I mean, there's a genetic factor here too that we can't necessarily do a whole lot about. And then there's other, the rest is other factors, your environment, structures, the healthcare system, the kind of healthcare you get. That last one too sometimes gets a lot of attention, but it's maybe only about 10% variation in health disparities is due to the quality of the healthcare that we actually get. So, you know, it looks like behavior is probably the largest chunk of that. And that's also kind of common sense. I mean, exercise and eating, you would think would be the most important things on our health. And I think the studies actually show it's more eating. Exercise, unfortunately, maybe doesn't have as much of an impact as what we hope sometimes, as far as losing weight anyway. It can help certainly in other ways. But eating probably has, eating habits certainly have a bit of a stronger impact there. So it's also a little bit of common sense, but studies have borne that out, that it's simply getting us to eat healthier and also exercise more could certainly have an impact. I know that's not an easy thing to do. You often have to do that on a group level. You need social support. I mean, the anthropologists and sociologists understand that we're so influenced by the people around us and by the groups that we're in. So it's not really just an individual thing. So if you get a group together, if you get a family together, if you get extended families or neighbors together to work on things. They've done some of this at colleges too, where they've noticed large-scale obesity among some of their students. You get college programs, you get people together, and the group aspect is often more fun. I agree. A lot of what you're saying does sound like common sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. And have you encountered pushback on your ideas and you feel like you are an outlier in your field? talking about these things? Yeah, unfortunately, it's the academic climate, certainly, or the public climate is not really healthy right now. I think there was something recently in the British journal Nature, one of the leading science magazines, and it was an article about something else, but there was a side comment that, well, the you know health disparities are due, some people say they're either due to genetics or to racism. That was the two choices there. You're either, it's either racism or it's genetics. There wasn't even a mention of behavioral aspects at all. And I mentioned this on, this was posted on a Facebook page. I mentioned this on a Facebook page on biological anthropology. And I said, look, there's studies that show, you know, you've got to include all these aspects. And then, of course, a number of people chime in and say, well, it's just all systemic racism. I think people's taste and habit and their family socialization and and family patterns of eating and exercise are much more important but it's certainly, if systemic racism isn't there, it's, it's an indirect cause of that and certainly not a major one. Yet the tone and the climate of discourse in the public is so much oriented right now to look at racial disparities as being due to systemic racism that the discussion right now is it's just not helpful. People aren't looking at the things I think that could really matter and really help. And that's really unfortunate, I think. It really does leave out all potential for human agency. And I do think that underlying your blog is a major question about, one, personal responsibility, but also just the nature of free will. 
And I wonder where you stand on the notion of this. Whether the philosophers say free will exists or not, I think we have to believe we have some power over our actions. And that's been clear for anyone that works with people and with populations. We have to believe that we can have some power over what we do and that we can make changes in our lives. And this is, you know, this, this, you see this at the local level in all sorts of self-help groups and 12 step groups and things like that, that have had a lot of success over the years. So it's almost like there's this discourse at the academic level or at the press level that it's all structures, but then on the ground and you look and people are making these changes and they're doing these things, but this is not what gets attention in the press. I got one more question for you. What's your bottom line and what do you really want to make sure people take from your work and this particular essay? We have to understand how people live their lives in different ways. And we don't do that just to criticize one group over another, but we want to understand what influences us and why people live in different ways. And health disparities is certainly one example of that. So if we understand that the influence on health disparities are partly lifestyle, partly behavior, exercise, and eating, I think the interventions at that level can really help with tough issues like COVID and diabetes and the real serious health disparities that we do have. So we need to have a really balanced approach, structures, cultures, and individual behavior, and see how these things interact. And there is some work that's being done to look at all these things, but I'm worried that if we focus all our attention on structures, we're really not going to make much headway in this issue. Michael Jindra on Heterodox Out Loud. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we have a favor to ask. Subscribe and download us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Davies Content produced this show. I'm Zach Rausch. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.